Well, Art, um, I imagine people will uh, will be dialing in for the next minute or so, but just in uh, respectful of everybody's time. Um, yeah, I think I'll just do a really quick introduction. This is the monthly NDSA Infrastructure Interest Group call. Um, our topic today will be an overview of folks' experience at uh, PASIG 2019, recently held in Mexico City. Uh, Art, I'll let you introduce your folks, but uh, Art Pasquinelli, who is the program manager for LOCKS at Stanford Art, is that your official title? Yes, sir. Yeah, so and Art um, has a um, a long and storied history with PASIG. Uh, Art, I'll let you get into that if you choose, but at this point, I'd just like to uh, hand it over to you and, and thank you once again for being willing to facilitate this call. No, I appreciate the, the interest, so thanks, Corey. Thanks, Nathan. Um, can you guys see my um, slide up? Yeah, it looks good. Okay. Um, let me just jump in, uh, and uh, I think people will be coming in as we speak, but um, for introduction, uh, I think there's a few names I, I don't recognize who probably haven't been to PASIGs before, but the PASIG uh, uh, goes back to like 2007. I'll get into that. But I wanted to thank the speakers. Um, you know, I've been involved in the steering committee since the beginning. Uh, Dave, David Miner from UC San Diego has uh, also been involved since about the beginning. Uh, Courtney Muma. Uh, from the Texas Digital Library will be speaking. She's another committee member. So I started off with two committee members and then Oya hadn't been involved for a few years. So I'm looking at her as a newbie and she did a, a really great blog post um, on the event. And I want her to come from a different perspective and, and give her input of what she saw uh, at PASIG in Mexico in, uh, in February. So, uh, but thank you for inviting me. I, I think of all the groups in the in NDSA family, uh, this is the one that's more most pertinent to PASIG. Um, PASIG was started in 2007 uh, with, uh, it was basically Sun Microsystems and Stanford getting together. And it was, the focus was, you know, Mike Keller came, you know, was talking with me and I was saying, Mike, who, who's doing what in the world? And he goes, you know, Art, I don't know either. So it's like we, we got a small group together in 2007, and then it became more of like 150 people. And it was really focused on looking at preservation, what the best practices were, but also having people get up and talk about mistakes in public. And it's always been a very collegial meeting. It's not formal. Uh, we don't do a lot of calls. We don't do any calls for papers. We put a skeleton agenda up months before, uh, generally, and then let people add in if they're uh, excited about the topics that they see. Uh, there is a steering committee, and again, David's on it, Tom Kramer's on it, Courtney's on it, Neil Jeffries from uh, Oxford. So it's definitely 50-50 uh, Europe and the U.S. And uh, it was global, but you know, time zones, trying to organize time zones was difficult. So it basically became uh, a, a US, North America, and um, European uh, committee. Uh, but it is one of the groups that's probably the most international. It's probably at least 50% international as far as the membership, which is around 2,000 people. We have. Um, uh, we have an annual event, basically annual. Sometimes we skip a little bit more. But the PASIG Mexico City event um, was held on February 12th through 14th. There were also workshops around that. So there was an Archimatica workshop, a LOX workshop, an NEDCC assessment workshop. I think Libnova had one too. So we added to a lot of the richness of the core event on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday with workshops. So, but this was the first time we did a Latin American event. It was bilingual and that worked out very well. Comex was a great host. Um, and so we had three very full days plus two extra days. But what really surprised me of the whole event was all the workshops were full. So there was a lot of interest from the uh, Latin American attendees, most of them from Mexico. 
Uh, and uh, again, very collaborative. People were catching up with people they knew. And also there was a lot of walking across the, um, the event, people introducing someone to someone else. So I know there has been a lot of good collaboration. I think that's one of the things that PASIC has informally done over the years is, is we've, we've raised the, the level of the discussion that took place a lot of, by a lot of informal activity. And uh, I know the committee's proud of that. All the resources are available now. Uh, we have Figshare up, thanks to David's uh, great work uh, with all the presentations. The um, Mexico City website is here, and you can see the program. You can see the, uh, uh, everything you need as far as the workshops. So if there's something or someone you want to meet from that's sitting there on the agenda, you can always contact the, uh, the steering committee. But all the background is there. Uh, Oya is on the call, and I want her to go over. She did a great blog, and we also had a lot of Twittering going on during the event. So it's very, uh, you have a lot of in-depth information, a lot of slideware uh, up that could be uh, usable by anybody. All the past, all the past conferences uh, for PASIG, um, including the last one, are linked in in the main web page, which is uh, uh, the last uh, note here. Uh, Preservation Archives SIG, and that's also where you can sign up for the mail lists. The mail lists are going to be merged in, in the next week or so, so there will only be one mail list, so it'll be an open mail list uh, that people can um, uh, advertise into. Most of you are probably already on it, but if you're not, it's um, you can email me or just sign up via the, the reference on that, pay, that last PASIG website. Quickly, uh, I want to leave a lot of time to the other speakers. Uh, my impressions. Uh, pacing, again, has always been very practical. It's always been talking about hardware architectures, linking into workflows, uh, practitioners, but high-level practitioners talking to one another. Um, people want infrastructure guidance. That's what I got out of it. And they want to hear about case studies. So we'll be focusing a lot more on that, I, 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 I imagine, in the future. That includes storage, architectures, open source, and commercial solutions, and the economics of keeping uh, preserved materials, both on the storage and uh, in the, the people sense, paying for people. So, one thing that came out was there were a couple presentations. Neil Jeffries gave a good one on the landscape around hardware. Um, and then Julian Morley from Stanford gave one on what he's doing with the Stanford Digital Repository. People really like those presentations. So we're going to make sure we keep a good portion of what, what's going on uh, around storage trends, cloud trends, the economics. So that is a, a definite uh, connection with where this uh, NDSA interest group is targeted. So um, let's, we definitely need to collaborate. Uh, there was a good discussion on different options for, uh, for levels of assessment. I hope some of the other speakers will get into that. Uh, not everybody has to do, um, you know, ISO standard level uh, assessment. There was discussion on internal assessment, you know, and also on peer assessment. So uh, that was a big discussion point in everything. We did a landscape of available solutions the first day, and um, it, it became known to everybody that there are a lot of vendors and a lot of open source solutions out there. I think my recommendation to the steering committee was that the steering committee actually takes hold of this as a topic and uh, presents it to uh, the PACIG attendees going forward um, because, um, yeah, we left a lot of vendors out in that presentation and um, it is something that everybody really wanted. Uh, the first presentation, which was an adaptation I did of uh, Tom Kramer's longer presentation and was given very aptly by uh, David, 
uh, in fact, it was probably the highest rated uh, presentation of the event, uh, was, um, you know, getting the, the basics of digital preservation. And the one thing, you know, that I think came out in the whole conference was preservation is an ongoing process. And even if you put something in the cloud, it's not just dumping it in the cloud, it's dumping it and monitoring it. So um, there was a lot of cloud discussion, which is important because uh, everybody's looking at it. There was discussion around, you know, how do you add, you know, issues like provenance in a cloud solution. And there are evolving answers in that space right now. So I hope some of the other speakers will get back to that. And then um, Mary Mol Molinaro came from the Digital Preservation Network and did a great um, synopsis in one of the, I think it was Courtney's uh, uh, panel and was very open about, you know, uh, you know why did you, uh, the, the DPN did not, you know, succeed. Uh, you know, I had dealings with DPN and, and it took a long time to get off the ground. And um, when it did get off, I think there was a, a lack of connection with actual contributors uh, at some of the institutions. But uh, it just took a long time to get off the ground. I, I would appreciate some of the other speakers maybe getting into that. But Mary was very open. And uh, I have, uh, her and Dave Kohler did a, a stellar job uh, closing that down. I think it's, uh, uh, you know, the, the epitome of how things should be uh, sunsetted. So um, with that, let me get into some of the other people who are sitting in the audience and actually uh, running the event and uh, open up to, um, to discussion. Uh, David, you were next. Do you have slides? No, Art, I was just going to talk. I was just going to give some quick impressions following up from the things you were saying. Okay, should I, should I close? Or oh, that's I totally, it? actually, why, why don't you go ahead and close because if nothing else, um, your 3,000 unread email messages are stressing me out. So uh, okay. I will stop looking at that. Um, yeah, so as Art said, hi, David Miner here. I, I know many of you. I'm at uh, UC San Diego in the library. Um, I've been heavily involved in digital preservation for a long time. Um, used to work, um, be a manager for the Chronopolis program, um, and then handed it off to Sybil Shea for a couple of years ago. I think you probably all know her. As Art said, I've been a member of the steering committee for over a decade now, and so PASIC is near and dear to my heart. So I thought I would just take a couple minutes and do two things. Um, one is I wanted to mention some of the highlight presentations, the standout ones for me. Uh, as Art said, these are all available online. And so if these sound interesting to you, it'd be a good way to, you know, go in and jump in and look at them also. Um, and then also just give a sense of, as, a, as an old timer here, uh, where PASIC has gone and kind of what, what we saw in Mexico City. So if, and this is in no particular order, um, so some of the standout presentations for me, and, and these really reflect on the general PASIC notion of being very practical, right? It's about, as Art said, what went wrong, what hasn't gone wrong, who are we not talking to, who have we missed in the conversation, uh, et cetera. And so that's, that kind of jumps out. So the first one that I, I really enjoyed, um, we had the CIO uh, from the Holocaust Museum in Washington Museum, in Washington, D.C., excuse me, uh, talking about a CIO's perspective with digital preservation. And it was a very frank, open presentation on uh, how he, I think he's been there maybe five years, something like that, um, how he kind of stumbled into this world and didn't really understand what, what the heck is this stuff people are talking about and didn't really get it from a, a pure IT perspective. And really, his talk was just brilliant about how to interface with your IT folks and how to interface, not even necessarily from a CIO, but just people in, in down the hall running the machines and kind of speaking a shared language and, and really talking about how they want to help and they want to be part of the discussion and, and giving a sense of how to do that. So I, I found that to be a really helpful presentation. Uh, another presentation, and I actually noticed he's on the call. I didn't, I wasn't expecting that so that I didn't, know this ahead of time, but um, Eduardo de Valle's talk um, on comparing uh, the airline industry and safety in, in the airline industry um, was brilliant and got a lot of people talking and really pointed out things like human factors and a lot of the 
safety requirements put out by places like the FAA and things like that that have made plane well, absent some of the things that have been going on recently, but made planes is incredibly safe compared to where they were before. And again, asking some basic questions about are there things we should be considering in the digital preservation realm when we're so focused on we don't want to lose things, right? We don't want things to go wrong. There are strategies to do this that the rest of the world has developed that we don't tend to take on board. And so it was, was, again, a very thought-provoking presentation. Um, Art mentioned a presentation by Julia Morley at Stanford on the economics of digital preservation. And Stanford has a long history at PASIG of presenting on this topic. And I think it's something that was really the only presentation kind of really devoted to that this year. And it was really well done. And as a steering committee member, it's something I'm, I would really like to push to regrow that, that topic a bit more. It used to be a much larger presence at PASIC, and I think it's something that it never goes away. Uh, people never really understand it, and it's something that I think would be worth really exploring. Uh, and then I think the last thing I want to mention that PASIC has also always done, and we had, again, a little bit less of it this time that, than I would have seen, is looking to the future. So Art mentioned and I mentioned PASIC is very practical, very down to earth solutions. What are people doing now? But we've also had a handful, a, a measurable percentage of people who are there who are really cutting edge, cutting edge to the point of being almost vapor sometimes. And a lot of times those things don't pan out and sometimes they do. And sometimes we've seen them come to fruition eight years after they've been presented on. And so we didn't have an awful lot of that this time around. And not necessarily intentionally or unintentionally, but I think it's something that um, in our surveys, we definitely saw some comments from people like, I'd like to see some more cutting edge stuff there. Um, but, and as an example of that, the on the very last day of PASIC, the third full day, we went till five o'clock. These are full conference days. And we had a, a session that was added basically at the last minute um, about looking to the future, did something like digital preservation in the year 2030. And a bunch of people had to leave because of logistics. I had to leave because of logistics. Uh, but I was keeping track of, of the people in the room. And they went on for hours afterwards in the room talking about this stuff. And so, A, it shows you how interested the people at PASIC were um, to be there. And, B, how much that topic resonated with people. So I think that's, that's very much a learning moment. Uh, the other thing I want to mention, Art mentioned also earlier a presentation or two on the vendor landscape. And, and feedback we got from vendors on that. Um, and uh, Mia Culpa, I was actually one of the people working on that, that presentation and want to acknowledge, okay, there was obviously a much richer landscape that we, we didn't really, we could have presented more on. But I also find it heartening because thinking back over the history of PASIC, say even as recently as five years ago, certainly 10 or 12 years ago when we started, if you were to do a presentation on kind of trustworthy vendors in the digital preservation space, your talk would take like a minute and a half, right? And even then a bunch of people would say, yeah, but they're not really doing digital preservation. I think it says a lot about our community that here in 2019, you could do a 15 to 20 minute presentation and talk about a dozen or more organizations, companies, not-for-profit, commercial, that are really focused on digital preservation. And you, the main complaint you get is, well, there's a whole bunch of people you left out. It really speaks to the robustness and the maturity of this field. And I think it's something we don't acknowledge enough. Um, and that really stood out for me. Uh, I think the last thing I'm going to mention, then I'll hand it off to the next person after this, is something we've always done at PASIG, and we lessened it this year, and I think to our detriment, and we're going to do again, is usually the first day or the first half day is dedicated to a digital preservation boot camp, right? And it's really starting at the basics. What is a checksum? What is trustworthy storage? Uh, what does it mean to have multiple replications? Um, what is the OIS model? And we always present that and, you know, half the audience is like, well, this is what I do for a living, thanks. But then the other half of the audience is, I've never heard of the word checksum before. Thank you for explaining that in depth. I understand it now. And I think we really missed that in, in this, uh, this PASIC uh, and, and kind of an explicit block like that. And I, I think we'll definitely be drilling back into that for the next event um, <clears throat> when it comes up in the next year or so. 
So I think um, I think that's it for me. Art, who who would you like to hand it off to next? Uh, Courtney would be next. Okay, tag. I'm it. <laughs> 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 thank you, Art, and thank you, David. Um, so just a quick introduction for those of you on the phone who don't know me. Um, I'm Courtney Muma. I'm the Deputy Director of the Texas Digital Library. Um, my history is in web archiving at the Internet Archive and also um, the Digital Preservation System Archive, Matica, for a very long time in Canada. I've been with the steering committee of PASIG since 2016, which is kind of shocking for me to think about that. Um, that doesn't seem that long, but um, it seems longer than it feels like to me. So, <laughs> um, in a good way, um, because I feel like the steering committee has done a lot of work, um, in particular putting together some guidance and putting a lot of effort into creating better guidance for program committees um, for each of the individual um, PASIG meetings. And I think that's continuing to grow based around a lot of um, what David was saying, you know, making sure we have a really strong focus on that first day boot camp, for instance, and provide a little bit more structure perhaps to the program committees in the future. Um, that's one of the things that came up after Mexico City that, that we talked about in depth at our steering committee meetings. Um, so all that to say, um, I've enjoyed being with the steering committee so far and I'm staying on. Um, and I've also participated in several of the individual program committees, starting with New York City. And then um, I also participated in the planning for Oxford. And then I didn't intend to, but ended up uh, participating on the Mexico City program committee as well, um, just because uh, we needed a little bit more guidance. It was a very new area for us um, being in Mexico. Um, as Art mentioned, we had, this was a bilingual con conference. So um, we had, this wonderful addition of having translators um, and so that sessions could be live in English or Spanish for attendees. So I'm just going to go over kind of my high level impressions. Um, and a lot of these are going to overlap a bit with what both Art and David touched on. Um, first being something about PASIG that I've noticed as a, a newer steering committee member is that every PASIG, um, because of its design, um, that it jumps around, that it, you know, tries to be in, you know, sort of uh, North America and then going, you know, across to a different continent and kind of bouncing back and forth in that way, um, it really does mean that almost every PASIG, there's a huge chunk of new attendees. And I think that's another argument for that boot camp certainly. Um, but it also makes for just a really exciting conference and a really interesting Q&A for all of the sessions. Um, in this one in particular, the program committee was very much committed to making it affordable for those in the global south. And so I thought that was an exciting thing that the program committee decided early on to deeply discount attendance for people in the global south and uh, especially proud of the steering committee for um, understanding and facilitating that. Um, so I think that that was a really interesting and significant um, offering that we were able to do in Mexico City. In terms of the presentations, um, I'll, start, I'll start by echoing David's com comments about the landscape, um, the, the need to understand the landscape in terms of vendors and service providers better. Um, it's really strong in our community, I think, and um, you know, it's very difficult to put together such a landscape because of exactly the reasons David said. The growth over time, um, there seems to be a new vendor or system available um, really rapidly now in a way that didn't exist five or six years ago. Um, and each of the vendors and systems and services offered tend to overlap um, because usually they're not offering just one piece of the digital preservation puzzle. They're usually linking together multiple parts of the digital preservation workflow. Um, and they're not all doing the same parts of the workflow. <laughs> so um, I think there's a lot of work to be done in this area. And I think this community, the NDSA in particular, is a really good place for that work. So I can envision a partnership um, in building those landscape preserva uh, presentations and kind of this like matrix of understanding of the vendor landscape um, together so that we can present it during the boot camp um, consistently with PASIG events. 
Um, I think that Paysig struggles in general, speaking of vendors, uh, it grapples with kind of vendor relationships um, like no other, and largely because of Paysig's focus on being practical knowledge about digital preservation. And so that means we want a tight relationship with vendors and their services and products. And we want to make sure that everyone who attends understands those. Um, but that does mean that uh, it is difficult to it is difficult to figure out how much involvement vendors should have um, in the, the main conversations in the con conference. And I think that's something we're going to continue to struggle with over time. Um, it's definitely something I don't think that we have entirely figured out yet. Um, we know that having vendors involved is a positive thing for the conference. It's that sort of level in, of involvement and influence that I think we're going to struggle with for a while uh, before we get it closer to right. Um, in terms of economics, with, which Art and uh, David both touched on a bit, um, I'm going to echo the, the failure stories seem to be very valuable. And from my perspective, it seemed like people were really craving those stories of failure and how you overcome problems and milestones um, because they're trying to build business cases internally and it really helps to have real life examples and that's something that I know that the Digital Preservation Coalition is pretty good about collecting those sorts of stories and I think it would be nice if we did a better job of that and of sharing failure stories um, in North America at least. Um, then I also would say that a lot of people wanted more discussion about audit, um, sort of the value of self audit versus having an external auditing body and also ideas about how or if it's even possible to audit a system independently without looking at all of the programmatic um, requirements that happen outside of any system that's dedicated to any part of digital preservation. Um, so I think that we'll continue. It seems like every pacing that I've been to and participated in, we've had something about audit and compliance. And I think that that's going to continue to be valuable over time. Uh, and then just finally, the last thing that I that I saw this year that I hadn't seen much of in the past were a couple of presentations that really focused on methodologies of project management. And there were a lot of people in the audience who were really eating that up. Um, I know that project management has been core to the work that I've done since I started working in digital preservation um, and systems building in particular, um, but also just in project managing any kind of project to get some kind of program started or moved along in an institution. So I think that we'll probably see more of that in the future as well. Um, so with that, uh, I think that's all I wanted to add, but obviously I'll be here for the rest of the conversation and I hope you'll have some questions and discussion. Thanks, Courtney. Oya, are you going to use slides or are you, uh, were you just going to talk? I think I'll just talk. Okay. All right, I'll take it over then. Well, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for joining this session. It's a great pleasure to be uh, participating along my PASIC colleagues. Uh, as Art will remember, I was involved in early days of PASIC and it's just a great pleasure to um, kind of get back and try to um, strong strengthen my involvement. I'm uh, with Ethica SNR. I work as a senior advisor and I actually am also at Cornell at the computing and information science. Um, I think, uh, you know, Art, David, Courtney, they, they highlighted some really uh, important issues. So I'm going to do a bit of an impromptu in means of what I will say, just kind of more build on uh, what we have heard from them. And given that uh, this is the infrastructure group and infrastructure is such a rich construct, I'm gonna to try to highlight a few uh, issues that impressions that uh, I kind of got attending the, uh, attending the conference, but also just, you know, just being involved in some studies and I have overseen the preservation unit at Cornell University Library for 20 years. So, you know, inevitably some of my opinions will be also affected my, by kind of my more contextual information. But if you look at from infrastructure perspective, uh, the conference was so rich on the soft part, soft side of infrastructure about people and values and the politics, the policies, the resources, and also 
it was equally strong on the hard part of hard side of infrastructure that I would you know, kind of more put technologies and workflows and standards. So uh, just kind of uh, maybe give you a few examples. One of them is um, what I consider big tent. Uh, I don't know if you had a chance to look at my blog about uh, PASIC just to kind of highlight some of the uh, themes that I took with me. But the big tent in a way refers to the broadening scope of um, uh, professionals and, uh, uh, and uh, skill sets that are included uh, under digital preservation. When I started digital preservation 20 plus years ago, it was a rich community, but you know, you had librarians, you had archivists, you had, it still it was a bit more cohesive. Now what I'm seeing is it's so diverse. There are folks from digital humanities, research data, uh, infrastructure IT, uh, and that uh, what we are seeing is the community is diverse, 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 but also, um, you know, it's, it's a huge strength, but it's also a pressure point in means of building a common language and being able to communicate and come up with some kind of common priorities and themes. I think along the lines of the uh, community broadening is that uh, the life cycle is getting broader. You know, we are now dealing with content upstream from you know, you know, research data all the way to it's being published or it's being on the web to the software that we are using to, um, uh, to decipher it, to make it valuable. So the first theme is really just kind of me being at pace again, being able to meet so many folks from different walks of life. That was just beautiful. It just, you learn so much from different perspectives. And again, as I said, it's huge strength but also a pressure point in means of building common bridges and identifying common themes and priorities and making sure that we kind of walk along together without leaving kind of huge gaps in this infrastructure, whether it's soft or hard part. The second piece that um, I really, really valued uh, <laughs> uh, during the PACE conference was about the values, values of uh, digital preservation. There were some such inspiring uh, talks about the diversity issues, inclusivity issues, social justice. And it's such a rich theme that I will, it's, it's very difficult to do due justice in a few minutes and to summarize to you, but I hope you'll be able to look at a program. But I just want to kind of give you one example. Uh, uh, this was just a conversation with a colleague from Center for Research Libraries recently, and I think this issue came up during the conference too, that uh, as we are seeing certain regions uh, relying more and more, for instance, you know, open access, uh, and this is really happening in Latin America and Caribbean countries where the formal publishing is more moving to web, but as you know, you know, web archiving still is more of an art than science in a way that still we are experimenting. So, you know, one of the concerns or the questions out there is that, uh, you know, could there be regional disparities, misalignments, so in a way, not uh, inclusive representation of the, uh, our cultural heritage, if we are not balancing our digitization, digital preservation efforts, especially between North America and then different countries. Because um, I feel like still, you know, digital preservation for many of us is a combination of research and practice that only maybe a handful of organizations have the resources and the um, service infrastructures to do due justice. So I am really so proud of our communities, um, how much advancement we made and how much progress we have seen and the community, but I'm also seeing maybe a widening in a way gap between haves and have nots in means of their tools and in means of their strategies. And what would be the impact of this on, as I said, the uh, uh, kind of inclusivity or diversity of the content that we are capturing. And the last theme I want to mention is about um, organizational readiness uh, and organizational readiness. I think, again, I'm just building on the excellent comments Art, David, and Courtney made. Uh, many of us are still approaching digital preservation as a project and that we all understand the importance of moving project to a program. So we are not only facing the um, 
kind of learning curve of, uh, you know, how do you manage projects, what are new managerial techniques, but also how do you turn them into programs, which means, um, you know, which means uh, making sure that you have the resources and then you have the policies that it's not a one time, one shot, but has a, it has a continuation. And uh, one thing I have heard, and I think this is really coming through different surveys too, is just a bit of a disconnect between those colleagues who are really working on the ground, who are experts, who are very fluent with the language, with the terminology, and those colleagues who are really, who have leadership positions, who are looking at broader knowledge infrastructures or looking at, you know, broader information spaces. Um, and I think this connect is also related to, uh, you know, how do we convey value to those who are in leadership positions that have, in a way, more power in allocating resources, especially uh, resources in means of financial resources. Uh, one thing that was acknowledged all through the uh, meeting was how preservation requires money. It's, you know, it's, it's still not a cheap uh, process. Uh, and uh, just, just to summarize, again, just to kind of maybe tease out one important question that I uh, left with from the, from the conference, but also I think many of us are understanding this uh, or thinking about this, uh, you know, in libraries, archives, heritage institutions, we have our own preservation programs. Inevitably, we, do, we develop our own digital asset management systems, workflows, technologies, and how do these kind of local environments connect to the uh, new services offered, whether the service being uh, the service being a vendor based service or the service being a collaboration. And I'm going to give a very quick example before wrapping up. You know, one of the challenges we had at Cornell as we were uh, members of Deepen Digital Preservation Network is that we understood what a great concept it was, but we didn't know how to connect the Cornell pipeline to DPN because it looked like there was just this disparity between what we needed and what uh, DPN was doing. Well, thank you for this opportunity uh, to talk with you and I'm going to turn it over to Art. Thank you, Oya. That was great. Um, Corey, uh, could we just open for questions? Um, yeah, great idea. And folks can use the chat or they can unmute themselves. I think that works. I have a question. Art, you said the, um, I thought you said the presentations were on the PASIC website, um, but I'm taking a look and I can't find them. The program doesn't seem to have hyperlinks. Did I misunderstand? No, the, if you go to the main PASIC website, um, Oh, they it's on the main added, site. So they okay. should be at the top of the list of past conferences. Got it. Thank you. I will make sure that's clear in the notes. No, appreciate it. Um, so you can either go to the main PASIG website, Preservation and Archiving uh, SIG, um, or go directly to the FIG share. So there's two options. Anyone else on the call that was uh, at PASIC would like to provide some thoughts as well? I do have a, a question if uh, if no one else is stepping in. Courtney, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit more about that tension between sort of practitioners and vendors and how, how do you see that playing out over time? Uh, well, I think that it's twofold. I think the one thing is that there's just a lot of um, misunderstanding about the different kinds of vendors that are available. So ex some examples are consultants who can help people understand their own program needs and perhaps connect them with um, system creators to fill in some of those gaps. 
Um, so that's sort of the more consultant model. Then there's, you know, it, then there's some of those consultant models that are starting to branch out into actually creating software. Then there are open source software providers that uh, are open source, but that also provide service as a service provider. And so do the same kinds of annual agreements and that sort of thing as those other proprietary vendors, um, which of course is the more closed model uh, where the contracts and the costs are usual, usually closed off and, and not communicable. Um, and then to complicate it even further, the services and systems, and specifically the systems um, that are offered towards digital preservation ends, um, all have, or many of them have similar um, functionality, but uh, also different bells and whistles. And so there's overlap, and then some have things that others don't. Uh, <laughs> it, it just, it's very, there's such, there's such a huge, um, landscape of offerings now that I think it's difficult for people to figure out exactly what's right for them. Um, and then that, that largely leaves them dependent on what the vendors have to say for themselves. And that's not a very powerful place to come from if you're an institution. And so I think one of the things that uh, PASIG um, in doing our landscape analysis, um, NDSA, um, and, and other groups um, who are kind of interested in transparency and openness about all of the different service offerings out there and how all the different business models work. Um, I think there's a really big role to play, an advisory role in creating a better understanding of what those offerings out there are and, um, and maybe even putting pressure on for more cost information to be shared. I think David was right. Um, that Stanford presentation about storage costs was absolutely, it was very popular <laughs> and people are still talking to me about it. Um, so I think people want to talk about cost and they want that sort of information. And then the other thing I was talking about, about um, the, the kind of tension at a conference level when you're organizing a conference, especially one that is geared towards practicality and the actual work of digital preservation. Um, you know, you want the people who are making the systems to be heavily involved because they have a deep understanding of this work and it's what they're able to focus on all the time in a way that people who are actually working in digital preservation, usually it's a portion of their job, not their entire job. So you want them involved, but you also don't want um, sort of a vendor takeover where again, um, the power is in the hand then of the vendors to communicate uh, the kind of, you know, greatness and completeness of their software uh, and not really the expertise, expertise of the practitioners influencing more of what the vendors are creating and providing. So I hope I didn't give you too much information for, for that answer, Corey. <laughs> no, I think that it's, just, it's, it's interesting um, that, uh, that sometimes uh, tension because it, um, uh, yeah, I mean, it's it, it can be quite fraught, and um, it, I was just really interested to see how you were sort of at PASIC sort of thinking through those those uh, those issues. So thank you very much. Sure. Where is it going to be in 2020? We've been uh, having discussions um, about where and when. So uh, it'll 90% sure it's in Europe. So uh, we've had discussions with Madrid and Berlin and uh, a couple other places, but I think right now uh, Berlin and uh, Madrid are in the um, uh, probably the, the front runners for sometime late first half of the year. So uh, stay tuned, and we'll, we'll get back to you on that, and then we'll shift it back to the U.S. the next year. Wow! And one Thank thing, uh, Corey, coming up. Um, the, the one thing I would have loved to see in, in, uh, in PASIG, and I think it would have been really great uh, for the Latin Americans especially, uh, is someone like you presenting, uh, like you've done at Open Repositories, about some of the uh, collaborations going on in Canada. I actually think some of that is, you know, globally leading efforts. And I, um, so we probably will call on you. Uh, uh, in 2020 to, to come in and, and maybe uh, 
outline how you've done some of those collaborations, um, you, know, you know, successfully from the governance and the, uh, the IT side. But uh, I definitely see a lot of the stuff that's going on in Canada as, as leading edge. Oh, thanks, Hart. All right. Any other comments or questions? Observations, thoughts? Just because um, I'm uh, being in an academic institution and sort of that's uh, been my uh, field for a while. Um, and PASIG sort of sits a little adjacent to that. Um, and I haven't been to a, to a, a PASIG and I've, I'm just noticing I'm saying PASIG and some say PASIG, so I'm not even quite sure how to say it. Um, but is there... Um, are there uh, scholarship opportunities? I think uh, Courtney talked a little bit about how um, they're, they're, the, the cost and making it something that, that the Global South could get to in Mexico was important. Um, I'm thinking about when it goes to Europe and it travels, um, you know, maybe the, um, the whole thing about cost and, and, and attendance is really localized every year and the efforts are put into getting the local attendees in as opposed to um, something more generic and having a sort of a scholarship model, but is there is there any sort of component like that or is it just uh, sort of more more localized like it was in Mexico or anything like that? So so this is David. I can I can answer that a little bit um, in terms of specific scholarships. No, um, we don't. But we'll, what we work really hard on on PASIC and we have done this for years and years and years is keeping the, the registration cost exceedingly low. Um, as Courtney mentioned, uh, we had this one case this year where we tried, this is the first time we've done that, and I think it was $50 was the registration. I forget what the denomination was, but it was, yeah. it was, it was 50 40, US, yeah. 50 yeah. US dollars. Um, but even that aside, um, when it's in the States or in Europe, we've really tried to keep the, the normal, well, early bird registration costs like $150, $200. And no, that's not a scholarship. And no, obviously travel is expensive, but um, we've really tried to leverage us not being a formal organization. That's kind of a double negative, but we've, we really kind of um, really take advantage of um, kind of the free labor of the people on the steering committee and the program committee and the local organizers. Uh, so we don't charge for any of the conference dinners or banquets or workshops or anything like that. So we've just really tried to keep the costs down as low as possible. And I do think as, as we said with the Mexico, uh, the low registration fee, that was a smashing success. So I would not be surprised if we look to do something similar uh, in the future. Um, one thing we've tried in the past, so I hosted a PASIC in San Diego about four years ago that, did not work uh, was to offer it to library school students or just students in general, but certainly uh, people in, in kind of the library and archival professions. And we had a couple people take advantage of it, but not many. So I think we're interested in open and exploring these kinds of things. And we're, as I said, over and over again, we're definitely interested in keeping the cost down as low as possible for attendees. Thank you. Great. Okay, any other comments or questions? Well, thank you very much, uh, Art, for organizing this, and David, Courtney, and Noya for, for joining us and sharing your thoughts. I really appreciate your time. Thank you, Cord. Thanks, thanks everybody for speaking. Yeah, thanks Thank for you. Me. Thank you very much. And uh, well, yeah, Nathan, do you want to handle the last five minutes of business? Is that, uh, is that all right? Sure, sure. Um, we uh, do have uh, our 2019 schedule of topics and facilitators. Um, we are looking for some uh, facilitators. I think we have five slots. Um, uh, June, August, uh, September, November, and December. Uh, this is linked to on the uh, agenda for the meeting today. 
Um, I think it's on probably the slot for most of the previous months so far too. Um, and the facilitator, um, uh, like Art did today, um, sort of uh, could be a panel, um, it could be a single speaker, a facilitator has some, some leeway in how they put this together, um, but organizes a discussion or presentation or a panel of some sort around the topic um, and sort of guides a, a discussion a little bit if need be. Um, it's just one meeting. Um, you could sign up for multiple if you're, if you're really gung-ho and, and are excited about some topics. Um, it's an easy way to, to get involved and uh, we're looking for some, some people to sign up for some of these slots. Um, so if you are interested, uh, please uh, let us know or just sign yourself up in one of these uh, months in this table. Um, we have software toolkit show and tell for June, um, international models for collaborative infrastructure in August, um, cloud preservation or using the cloud for preservation in September, uh, advocating for resources in November, and uh, economics and scale in December. Um, sounds like maybe we should get someone from Stanford for that one. Um, so uh, if any of those sound like something you might be interested in, um, let us know. Anyone, anyone interested? I can't tell if there is a distortion or if someone was trying to volunteer. Because you were all trying to volunteer at once. Uh, okay, and uh, we are also looking for a, a new member liaison. Um, this is a role uh, that would be new for this group. Um, someone who helps uh, new members who are, are coming into NDSA just sort of join the group and points out to some resources and helps them um, to sort of find where some of the past meetings are um, and help uh, join the conversations and um, sometimes you just some people don't feel adrift once they join the group. Um, there was an email that went out um, about a, uh, two or three weeks ago um, that has some more detail about that. Um, but if you're interested, you can send an email uh, to the, myself, to Corey, or to the interest group. Um, all right, and it looks like um, we have a possible presenter for June for the software show and tell from uh, AP Trust for the digital asset routing tool. That'd be great. Um, well, uh, feels like I'm doing a lot of talking, and uh, so if <laughs> there are no other volunteers, um, or no volunteers, um, I think I'll probably end it. Otherwise, I'm just going to keep babbling. So, <laughs> Nathan, can I ask you a question? This is Courtney. Please do, Courtney. <laughs> save I'm coming to save you. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, I'm just, I'm, uh, can I just, can we just email you? I need to look at calendar for um, some of these topics that require facilitation, but I might be able to grab one. I just need to spend more time with my calendar. Quality Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. And I think the, I think the dates are fungible. You know, if there's a topic you want, but you can't do it a certain month, I think those things can be moved around. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Corey, should we call it? Yeah, let's call it. Okay. Well, everyone enjoy the rest of your Mondays. Thank you for joining us. Thanks everyone, especially to the speakers. Have a great day.